Okay, right, let's kick this off. Uh, so, welcome everybody to the week 10 of uh, Open Life Science. This is our fifth cohort call, I guess, not counting some of the optional ones. Um, and given that that's a 15 week program, that means we have somehow hopped all the way to two thirds through. Uh, so I'm delighted and I'm so happy to see so many faces here today. So today our topic is designing and empowering for inclusivity. Um, so we had a little bit of homework before the meeting, which is the implicit bias quiz. Um, if you haven't done that, it's okay to scramble and start that now. Uh, it will take a few minutes, so uh, don't leave it. Um, let me see, I'll go through the housekeeping, right. So don't forget, we have a code of conduct for open life science. So generally that means we need to treat each other with respect and um, the way that you would like to be treated by another person. Um, Please do take a minute or two to read that as well. Uh, so it's not just something that we should mention, but it's also a good idea to be familiar with it. And if at any point you feel like you either experience or witness unacceptable behavior that isn't in line with our code of conduct, then you can report it to the organizers. So we have a team at openlifesci.org as an email address that you can email. If it is an issue with one of the organizers, which we sincerely hope doesn't happen, uh, then you can email the individual organizer, um, it organizers about what's been going on. And all of the email addresses are in the welcome section of our, um, of our document. I will also have a couple of shout outs. So thank you very much to uh, Biority at Emble for offering us the Zoom room today. We've been hopping around from Zoom room to Zoom room trying to find somewhere that we can not have the free calls end at 40 minutes. <laughs> uh, so it's really handy. And also Sudarshan suggested our icebreaker today. Uh, so thank you very much Sudarshan for putting some thought into that. That was really handy. Um, so what we're talking about today is inclusion. Uh, so basically what we're talking about is thinking about whether or not people uh, are, have a way to be included, whether they feel like they can participate in the community. And that might mean someone who looks like me or it might mean someone who doesn't look like me as well. Someone who thinks differently or has different circumstances going on in their life. Um, so we want to make sure if we're running an open project that we're making it open and inclusive to as many different people as possible. So if you've been doing the implicit bias quiz that we were doing earlier on, then you may have gotten a feeling for the fact that even though even though you might, you might already have internalized these values of I want people to feel welcome, I want people to feel, feel like they belong and like they can even take a leadership role if they wish. Just because you think that way doesn't always mean that all of your actions come out the way you hope they will. That sometimes there are implicit and unexpected biases. Um, so I think what we're actually going to do today is head straight to some breakout rooms. Uh, where we're, what we're going to do is we're going to discuss a little bit about what uh, our impressions were for um, when we were working on the implicit bias quiz. And we're also going to talk about what inclusion feels like. Um, so if you look on, is it page two or page three now of the agenda, we have a section called designing for inclusion. Um, and we'll put two to three people in the breakout rooms. Uh, Melvika, I don't know if you're getting those ready. Fantastic. We have three discussion prompts. Uh, so the first one is, what's a place that made you feel included the first time you visited, whether it's online or in person? The second one is, what made that place so inclusive? Uh, so think about what efforts were made so that you actually felt like you belonged in the place that you were. Uh, and then also discuss some shared insights on the implicit bias, bias test. Uh, I know it, it definitely made me feel very uncomfortable when I think about my implicit biases uh, and, and where, where you end up with those. And so try and be gentle with one another when we're discussing it and understanding and recognize that we, we're gonna have these biases and that we, as long as we recognize them and we work against them, you shouldn't be beating yourself up. Just try and change and try and consciously make sure that you are not acting upon them when you're aware that they exist. Uh, so are the, is the goal for the breakout room today clear? Can I have some thumbs up? I have lots of thumbs up. Excellent. And as a reminder, if you do have any problems, then you can ask for help when you're in your breakout rooms uh, and that will teleport the host straight in to discuss things with you. So Movika, are we ready?
Amazing. Do we want to pause recording if we haven't? Mm. Go back. No. Oh, Toby. Um, yo, I yeah. think for some of us, what happened is that we got kicked out of the Google Doc. It seems like we can't edit it anymore. Um, if you refresh, does it get Confirming? any better? Yeah, no, it says uh, request access. Uh oh. I think all of us got kicked out. Uh oh. Let's have a. Can I edit it? I can. I'm afraid to refresh it now because um, <laughs> I don't want to get me locked out. Has anyone gotten back in if you refreshed it? I'm back after the refresh. Okay. Because I remember like a few years ago, they, they, everyone got locked out and that would not be convenient in the middle of a call. Mm. I, think, I think I'm still out. I'm also still out. Yeah, it, it says, says request access. Link. Can you click on the link and see if you can edit that? Okay. Uh, if you refresh, does that help? Can you yeah. paste the link again in the chat? Yeah. No, for me, it doesn't work. Not even the one in the chat. Can you even see it? I can, I can see it, um, but I can't type in it. Okay. Yeah, same here. Um, so I'm going to say we have, we were going to do a bit more of silent Google docking. Uh, we can convert that to verbal for three minutes. Um, I think that'll manage and then we've got a talk so maybe just occasionally try refreshing throughout the talk and maybe we'll get you uh, unlocked if not and we get to a point where we want to ask questions or um, we have some shared google docking later we will pull out a hack md as our backup plan <laughs> um okay so how was the breakout room for everyone uh does anyone want to share any comments or any of the discussions or thoughts that they had from their breakout rooms uh, we talked about cultural sensitivity in an inclusive group. Any specific points that you really liked or? Um, I think it, it started by remembering that an inclusive place felt inclusive when people remembered our name um, and they also were able to pronounce it. And so from there, we discussed about cultural sensitivity. Yeah, uh, as someone with a weird name, I 100% agree. Uh, so my full name's Johanna and I don't even ask people to say it anymore because it's too hard. <laughs> um, so I have a look through some of the things that made you feel included the first time you visited. We have Brain Hack, we have Carpentries, we have the R community, we have OLS, amazing, thank you folks. Um, we have Research Bazaar Arizona, tech community in person. Yeah, it's nice to have some in-person examples as well. We have IRC for the first time. And going from Russian academia to German academia. Yeah, I guess different different uh, countries within the same domain type thing can were variances, that makes sense. College running group, wow. Um, and then some talks about what, what made that place so inclusive. We had being called by name, if you already know other people. Yep, that, that's great. Although I think we also find that sometimes you have this tendency to hang out just with the people you know. Um, so I guess a, f a mix of people you do and don't know probably helps there. Being invited to contribute. Yeah, I love that one. It is a it is a bizarre thing that you somehow, if you ask someone for help, it often seems to end up with people liking you better when you've asked for help. It's like not even giving the help, but asking for help. Others that look like you. Okay, yeah, that's a really good point. Took me a minute to assimilate that, but I think we're talking about like uh, one woman in an all-man group could be a bit bizarre, or um, one person who is a different skin tone from everyone else. Um, so yeah, having other people that you know look like you who are welcome can be really, really helpful. Uh, feeling like you can contribute and like people want to hear what you want to say. Absolutely. Um, I was in a discussion group last year. Um, Christine, you might have been there as well um where we were talking about ways to support people who aren't being heard uh, or who often get dismissed and people were saying one really good way to do that is just to say i agree when an underrepresented person says something just to support them so that shows that the majority of the group does agree so it's not like a woman says it and no one hears it and then the man says it and everyone agrees actually agree with the woman in the first place to make it really clear um we have Kirsty, I love that. I love that one of our speakers is actually a line item in what made the place so inclusive. 
great choice. Um, it was inclusive because it was. I guess that's the, yeah, if people try to include, then you will feel it's inclusive. This is uh, logical. And complete strangers offering to help me find a job or learn a new skill and caring about my success. Wow, that is a massive warm feeling. Um, how people behave, no discrimination and respect the cultural norms amongst the group. And then we have people not presupposing that I know everything. Yes, explaining the basics and understanding that it's okay to listen to the basics sometimes because other people may not have heard them even if you do know them. Um, and we've got a plus one on that. It is popular. Immediately felt welcomed and like I was friends with everyone. Uh, felt the established members were genuinely delighted to see a new person joining. That is amazing. Uh, giving voice to obvious biases and discrimination. Uh, Oh, hearing people acknowledge, yeah, sorry, this one's still getting written, so I'm getting a bit. <laughs> um, okay, there's still so much getting written at the minute, but I think, uh, please feel free, keep on typing, talk about the implicit bias test, this is all fantastic stuff. Um, but we probably, for the sake of time, want to move on to the next bit, so Malvika? Uh, Malvika, you're quiet. Can you hear me? Now we can. Okay, cool. So now we want to move on to our speaker, Alex, uh, who's on the call. I'm very excited to have them on the call, uh, who are going to talk about the inclusion and designing for inclusion, but also mentioning some of the things when designing does not only include thinking about the positive aspects of opening up your project, but how to protect the information abuse. So Alex. Let's see, I'm trying to share my slides. Can people see slides? Oh, no, I have to keep the button on share. Oh, it's so confusing. Modern technology. Can people see the slides and hear me? Looks fantastic. Wonderful. Okay, so yes. Oh, no, no, that wasn't the button I wanted. Okay, so Thank you, Malvika. Um, so yeah, uh, just to give a bit of context and background, Malvika originally stumbled upon another talk I did, which is called called Assume Worst Intent, which is a talk which is a talk aimed at software developers, people who build technology and online services, all about thinking about the ways that the services we we build will be used for evil or malicious purposes. I'm not going to talk about that today because that's a bit of a different topic. That's more aimed at software developers and stuff than scientists, but uh, that's out there on the internet, and I'll pop a link in the Google Doc later. What I am going to talk about today is more about inclusive design, the importance of thinking about inclusion in design, and a bit about unconscious bias and how that seeped into all our work. So like I said, I'm a software developer, that's what my day job, but these ideas are broadly applicable and they apply to science just as much as anything else. So we've already talked about it a bit already uh, on the course, so I can, I can, but let's just make sure I'm going to sort of define what I mean by inclusion, because I think it's one of these words that means a lot of different things. We hear it in a lot of contexts. It's next to diversity, accessibility. Let's break down, make sure we're on the same page. So imagine you were holding a party, and I want you to imagine, and please don't do it, because if you can't tell, I wrote this slide more than a week ago. If you send invitations far and wide, then that's diversity. You're inviting a wide range of people to participate but not really giving them any reason why they might enjoy your party. Inclusion is about making sure people actually have a good time at the party. And that might mean things like making sure you have a range of drinks available, making sure there's food that everybody can eat, making sure you spend time with somebody who traveled a long way out of town to come and see you. It's making the effort to ensure that people feel included and welcome. And when people feel more included and they feel welcome, then they're more comfortable to share their experiences, their ideas, their fears, their concerns, to challenge the status quo. And of course, those all have benefits for our communities. Particularly looking at a world, for example, like science, obviously science, we care about having lots of good ideas, but we don't know if an idea is gonna be good until, we've, until, you know, until after the fact. So we need to get as many ideas as possible and making sure we have a really diverse range of people contributing is one way to do that. But that's what inclusion is. Inclu that's why inclusion is important. And I think we'd all agree inclusion is the nice thing to have. But it doesn't always happen in practice, right? In many communities, in many groups, people feel excluded. They feel unsafe. They feel forgotten. They feel ignored. 
And so assuming this isn't malice, assuming people don't want to do this, why does this happen? And so one of the reasons, and one of the things Malvika wanted me to talk about is this idea of unconscious bias. Now, I personally don't actually love the term because I think it has quite a negative stigma. It can feel very negative, very critical. You know, it feels like it's a criticism of us that we have unconscious bias, that makes us bad people. And obviously, Yo was asking, oh, you know, did anyone feel slightly uncomfortable at the results of the unconscious bias test? I think it's a shame because I think there is a useful idea here, um, but often it gets lost in the, in the stigma and the, and the criticism. So let's instead talk about pattern matching. Okay, humans are very good at pattern matching. We look at the world, we have patterns, we use it to construct rules about how we think the world works. Everything is A or B. If P, then Q, either X or Y, and so on. And the rules we imagine are always correct, right? We might learn something as a child that the world behaves in a simple way and then grow up and we discover the world actually is a bit more complicated than that and the rules need adaptation. So the more of the world we see, the more we have to update our rules based on new ideas and information. And that's just part of being human. Now, often we come up with these rules subconsciously. You know, we're very good at our brain is optimized at coming up with these patterns. And we don't realize how many we've internalized. We don't notice we've adopted a rule until something breaks it. And that's what unconscious bias is. It's when we imagine that the world follows a particular rule, don't even realize we're following that rule, and that rule is inadvertently excluding or overlooking somebody. And when we act upon those rules, these incorrect rules, we can do things that make people feel excluded. So having unconscious bias, I don't see as a moral judgment on us. It's just this innate pattern magic logic that's gone a bit wrong. So let's look at a couple of examples. First of all, smartphones. So we've all got smartphones. Uh, I imagine many of you use them to record video. And if you're recording video, well, you might be uploading it to YouTube. So if you go back about five or six years, when YouTube released their first upload app for the iPhone, they discovered that about five or 10% of their users were uploading the video wrong, the wrong way up. To people. And you know, was this some sort of design trend? Was it a fashion statement? Was it a, was it a mistake? And actually, it was none of those things. It was a misunderstanding on the part of the YouTube developers of how people use their phones. So if you look at the picture here, we can see the person is holding the phone in their left hand, and that leaves their right hand free to come along and actually interact with the controls. Now imagine, so we can imagine that this person probably their right hand dominant. This is probably a right-handed user. Now imagine that a left-handed user is trying to shoot video. Well, they'd hold the phone in their right hand and can manipulate it with their left hand meaning they'd be holding the phone the other way up. And YouTube's mostly right-handed development team hadn't thought of this use case. They'd never considered that somebody might be holding their phone the other way up when they tried to record video. They'd internalized an incorrect rule. If somebody's recording video, then they hold their phone in this orientation. It wasn't until they had left-handed users that they realized their mistake. That's one example. Let's look at another. Um, so I know the open, you've done a bunch of these calls. I know you've done some work with Git and GitHub, both very widely piece, used pieces of software. I use them all day. And one of the great features of Git is that it gives, gives us an immutable record of our changes. It's impossible to change history in Git without it being obvious, very disruptive. And this is a good thing. It creates an audit trail, creates stable history, and so on and so forth. And that immutable history includes your code, your commit message, the date and your name. The committee's name is permanently baked into the history of a Git repository. And this can cause problems for people who change their names because now their old name is preserved forever in this Git history and it's incredibly disruptive to change it. And so, you know, I've got trans friends who've changed their name and they have to choose between abandoning a large body of work and no longer associating with their project that they worked on or accepting that the Git history is forever going to out them as trans. Okay, there's this unintended side effect of Git making the name an immutable part of the history that has to fall out down the line. Now again, I don't think this was malice from the Git developers. They just internalized an incorrect rule. Nobody ever changes their name. It didn't occur to them that this design choice might exclude users, but now 10 years later, we're all stuck with it. So that's the second example. Next, let's look at an example from my workplace. So I work at Wellcome Collection, which is a museum and library about the history of human health and medicine. And one of the things we have is we have this wonderful collection of digital historical images. You tag these images to make them easier for people to find. 
maybe an algorithm could tell us that these pictures are a man, a mountain, a market, or a mole. Maybe it could do all that tagging for us and save a human the work. But we've got to be careful because machine learning is good for many things, but one of the things it does is it takes our pattern matching rules, our unconscious biases, and it dials them up to 11. If humans are good at pattern matching, machines are amazing. And there are plenty of stories about algorithms replicating unconscious biases in the training sets, in the training sets of images they're given. So a couple of years back, Google got in hot water because they tagged images of black users as gorillas, which is incredibly insensitive. Microsoft and other companies had similar issues where their motion capture software doesn't detect dark skinned people. And again, you sort of, they've internalized these bad rules about what does a collection of images look like? All people have light colored skin. It's obviously not correct, but that's how that, that, that can end up having implications that we don't realize. And finally, let's move out of the digital realm and look at a physical example, motor cars. So modern cars are extremely safe. They're subject to rigorous crash testing. They're packed with safety features. We can see here two cars being tested Pretty serious impact here, but the passenger compartment in both cars remains relatively intact. So very safe, but repeated studies show that women are more likely to die in car accidents. And the reason this is because fairly recent, until fairly recently, crash tests only featured male body test dummies. They're actually based on a 50th percentile American man. That was the exact body shape and size that was used in all crash test safety testing. And so that was the basis on which safety features were designed. Now women, especially, especially smaller women, have a different size and shape to a lot of, to, to this 50th percentile man. And so they experience the forces in a collision in quite a more severe way. And the car industry is now using a wide variety of crash test dummies, but that obviously doesn't hurt, help anyone who's already been injured in an accident. And it's gonna take years before that inequality is worked out of the, of the pool of existing cars. So what's the message here? Inclusion has to be part of our design process. It's not something we can add later. It's not something we sprinkle on top like icing sugar. It has to be something we think about throughout our work, throughout our design process. You know, you look at some of those examples, they're all embarrassing, all annoying, but in some but it was hard to impossible to fix some of those. You know, YouTube, oh, they've got a bug, they ship it a fix, they update it. People forget about it fairly quickly. But those cars, those cars with the incorrect safety features, they're gonna take years or decades to filter out. And with something like Git, that is permanently baked in forever. We can never change that. So we need to think about inclusion throughout. And it's gotta be part of our design process. It's gotta be something we're thinking about throughout whatever piece of work we're doing whenever we're building something. So how do you actually do that? How do you actually design something that's more inclusive? And we talked about a bunch of them already on this call, which is great. I want to talk about some of the more general pattern for how you can get better at inclusion. And so let's go back to this idea of rules, of pattern matching. We exclude people because we internalize rules that don't accommodate them, that don't include them. So how do we spot those bad rules? How do we know that we're doing something wrong, particularly if we're not aware that this is a rule we've even internalized? This is just how the world is and it exists in our subconscious. And the way we do this is we widen our worldview. We go out and we listen to people who have different experiences to us. Because we're not gonna know a rule is bad until we see a counterexample, until we see something that challenges it, and then we realize, ah, oh, that, that doesn't feel right. Ah, oh, that's because I think all X is a Y, but actually this X is a Z. Uh, we, need to, we need to be able going out and finding lots of counterexamples, finding people who look different to us and listening to their experiences, listening to how they experience the world. Personally, I love Twitter for this. It's a great medium for interacting, listening to lots of different people, listening to their worldview, listening to people who are different to me, and they will explain the challenges they face, and then I register those, and I realize, ah, oh, that's a thing I'd never thought about before. Uh, and that affects my view of that, informs my view of the world, and hopefully means the next time I am, I'm involving somebody like them, I'm not gonna do something that might be exclusionary. And Twitter's certainly not the only way to do this. You can find any, plenty of mediums let you talk to people who don't look like you, but that's the one that works for me. So I don't actually know how long I've been going. I hope I've not got over time, but I hope that just gives you a little flavor of why inclusion is so important for design, why it's something we have to think about throughout. It's not an afterthought. 
and hopefully a new framing of unconscious bias, the idea of spotting patterns that we don't even realize we're, we're forming, and maybe thinking about that as ways to avoid excluding people in the future. Uh, slides and notes will be at the link, are at the link now, so you can go and get the notes and references and so on from that. And I think that's probably my time up. So thank you very much. Uh, where's the mute button? Thank you so much, Alex. Um, so now we're going to take 10 minutes time. So we will ask you to take five minutes for a silent Google docking to reflect on things that Alex has just said. And also we've added three prompts, uh, which are what was insightful about the design thinking for inclusion, what lesson can you apply on your project, and what are you doing now to combat bias? So let's take five minutes, we'll come back and have a few questions uh, addressed by Alex. Quick check, is there anyone who can't edit? Okay, I'm assuming y'all can edit, please, please ping me if you have, you're still having any issues. <laughs> Okay, we're going to slowly finish writing and we have some questions. Um, I'll put my question second, but we have one question which says, when we feel overwhelmed by how many biases we may have, what can we do to get over that feeling and make progress? That's a great question. So I think I'd sort of say, first of all, it goes back to the thing I was talking about, about biases having a negative stigma we sort of need to get past this and recognize that it's a moral failing on our part, that you are not a bad person because you've picked up some of these biases because you've internalized some of this stuff. This is just, it's the reflection of the society we live in. Um, so that's what, that's one part and sort of, you know, just stop beating yourself up. The other thing to recognize, and this is true, not just of treating unconscious, bias, but it's true of all self-improvement exercise is, Anytime you dig into a problem, right? Most problems are fractal. You dig into them and you discover that actually the problem is much bigger than what you originally realize. And you discover there's more depth to it. And so sort of try to pick on specific bits of it and get better at those, right? Just as you wouldn't try to learn all of science and we specialize in particular areas and we accept that there'll be some areas where we're not gonna do as well. So try to, so try to pick on particular areas and focus on improving. No. And I
expert on the biases here. So maybe that means you've got to do more work when you're tackling questions around that area. But yeah, good question. Thank you. And one question that I wrote, which is about how can someone address a situation when they notice a mistake or bias in their tool or community only afterwards, or after it has been released, um, but they also notice that their bias has caused some sort of error or mistake. Is there a good way to accept the mistake and go on? Uh, I mean, obviously say sorry, right? acknowledge it. Uh, don't be shy about it. That's obviously important because again, we're all, nobody's perfect, right? We all make mistakes all the time around bias and inclusion. I will say, you know, I'm trans, but I will say trans exclusionary things. I'm mixed race, but I will say racist things. And like, if we expect, if you expect, if you hold yourself to a standard of perfection, you will always find yourself beating yourself up. When you make a mistake, own up to it, acknowledge it, acknowledge that, you know, some people won't, not, aren't going to accept that apology, but at least you've put it out there and at least you've tried to correct it. And then maybe that becomes a teachable moment for somebody else, right? Somebody else sees your mistake and they're not going to make that mistake in future. Do we have more questions and someone wants to verbalize that? Stunned silence. I can verbalize my question. Do you have some advice on how to go? Um, what, what, like, what could one do if you are confronted with a really non-inclusive management? You know, like some, like imagine a project manager who just wants to get certain deliverables done and doesn't doesn't really doesn't mind losing people along the along the way. Uh, is there? I mean, are there some things? like some ways of approaching this kind of people. Are there some advice on how to do it? So I think two things. One is to, um, obviously I think like most of it, I imagine most people on this call, we all sort of accept that like, it's a good thing to do. It's a fair thing to do. It's an equitable thing to do. But something you can do if you're faced with somebody who's a little bit more driven by the numbers is try to find a way to revert to, to relate diversity and inclusion back to the business case, back to the thing they actually care about. So for example, if we're doing, um, if you're doing science, right, I was, I was saying, science is about having lots of good ideas and we get better ideas when we have a wider range of people, when we're not just drawing people from a very narrow group of people. So that's one thing. Um, and you know, the more you can relate back to it, the more, I mean, it's not, that's obviously not great because then you're saying diversity is tied to business value. And like, well, you're only here because you contribute something is not great, but that's a start. The other thing, there is another talk I did last year about this thing called the cut effect. And the idea is basically that when you design with inclusion in mind, often you actually end up with better things overall than you started with, even though you knew you were going to be more inclusive. And the name of the effect comes from these like dropped curbs on pavements, but the Americans call them curb cuts, originally introduced people who used wheelchairs, but of course actually also benefit people who are in push chairs or wheelie suitcases, or you're, trying, you're bringing heavy luggage, or you've got a foot injury or whatever. Um, often pointing that and saying, actually, like if we think about inclusion, it'll be this sort of force multiply can also be a way of looking at it. But uh, yeah, it's a hard problem. And I will put a link to that talk in the Google Doc as well. We have two questions in one minute, but uh, feel free to take a little bit more time because I'm the next speaker. So the question is, how do we start building a list of biases to consider in planning? How do we prioritize? Uh, how do we build a list of biases and how do we prioritize? Um, list of biases, uh, I mean, by the very nature of them, right, then being unconscious, you don't really know they're there. But the, uh, what is it? The Equality Act, ha the Equality Act 2020, if you're in the UK, has like a list of what it calls protected characteristics. I think it's race, religion, gender, disability, sexual orientation. And there are two more that I'm forgetting. I apologize. But like those lists, sort of lists are often a good way to do it. In terms of prioritization, I tend to think about, um, that's a really tricky question, will depend a lot on context, but I tend to think about where's somewhere where I can make a big impact. You know, where's, where's an area focusing on that actually I could make a difference. Uh, so that, yeah, but that, that's gonna depend a lot on context and what you're able to do. 
we have last question and it's still being written. Can I ask the author to verbalize their question? Yeah, it was me. Um, yeah, I work at Oxford. There's a lot of a uh, certain group of people, um, particularly it's class, to be honest. It's particularly, there's a lot of this white hat middle class thing. And I know that I have certain um, negative biases um, particularly associated with class so when I hear people's accents and things um, and recognizing that I probably need to do some work on that the way the people that are traditionally included elsewhere I I can be a bit um, not dismissive but I value their opinions less and that's probably not a good thing mm, so I think I'm just verbalizing it is making me aware that it's um it's something that I'm going to need to be aware of. Yeah, it's 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 it, it's it's like once you're aware of it, that's always the first step, and you can start yeah. to be aware that you're undervaluing someone's opinion. And then again, going back to that idea of going and listening to people's life experience, obviously listen to people's life experience, but also it's great to listen to people talk about something completely unrelated to diversity, just as a sort of a reminder that yeah, actually people in this space, like people who don't look like me, can have good opinions, right? It's why, for example, so I mentioned I'm trans, but I also do a bunch of tech stuff and stuff around inclusion and technology and programming because like I'm out here saying like, hey, trans people, we're normal, we're just like the rest of you, we have opinions and expertise. So again, like if you can find people who sort of, you know, perhaps are in a group that you would normally dismiss from and look at some of their work and go, oh, actually there are people in this group in this group doing cool stuff, that might be a thing you can do as well. That might be useful. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks again, Alex, for sticking with us for so long and sharing all the insights you can reach out to alex by email and they have also added their social media and they are yep. super active there so thanks again so much thank you for having me so we're gonna move on and it would be me talking about mountain of engagement so i'm gonna share my slides Okay, so can you all see it? Okay. It's fabulous. Thank you. <laughs> um, so you know me, I'm Malvika Sharon. Uh, I uh, work as a community manager for the Turing Way that Kirsty is the lead for, and I'm also your OLS team member. So the topic that we're gonna discuss today is called Mountain of Engagement. And it is about discovering pathways and patterns in engagement in your work. So first of all, uh, when we talk about mountain at workspace, this is something that you all can imagine. We have management level and within the organization, each of these members are leaders with responsibilities of certain tasks that delegated to them or that they delegate to others and they also are responsible to finish them. What does this for them is to create sense of reward for finishing certain tasks, but also they find opportunities for appraisals and promotion that allows them to gain more leadership abilities. And we're gonna think about that in terms of our members. We will talk about if these kind of mountain can be specifically adapted within a community of member to help them understand what kind of tasks they like to engage with and how we can offer them recognition for their work and provide more opportunities for skill building and leadership within the community. So this is one of my most favorite sketches ever because we helped design this. Um, it's because we often talk about collaboration when we start thinking about engagement and collaboration and research space often gets limited to topics like what project is, is this? Who are we going to work with? What are our common goals? What are the resources and skills we have? And the things that actually matters because it affects all the stakeholders, like how are we going to teach, uh, act with them? Are we going to be uh, providing them an inclusive workspace? Do we have code of conduct? Are we aiming to build a diverse team? 
these are often not the first thing that comes in mind when uh, talking about collaboration. But you have spent your last month creating things like code of conduct, contribution guideline, open licenses, and so on, which is basically focusing on the lower part here. So now coming to the engagement, community engagement is about giving equal opportunities to all your members to exchange values and empower each other to act on issues that enhances community experience and help achieve a positive outcome. So the focus is providing opportunity, empowering them so that they can act. Mountain of engagement helps us discover pathways and patterns of engagement in our work. It helps us discover how people interact with our community and organization and how our cultures get affected by it. How do we discover patterns that help people move from one type of interaction to other types of interaction? Can we develop pathways for them to move from first contact to sustained engagement to leadership? So basically this picture again, where each of these members ask specific question. If there is a person who's very new to your community and they are aware of other task within the community, the question could be, how can I move to the upper level? There might be some people who are just there because they like your community. They are probably not engaging very actively. There are people who've been there for a long time and they wanna gain more leadership skills. And then there are people who are there who want to just do the right task, use the right resource and use effectively their time. And then there are people on the leadership who might have just started by fixing a small bug who are now a regional head. So mounted, mountain of engagement have five main steps. First is a list of people's interaction with your work. Second is thinking about deepening levels of engagement. So in this case, you're gonna create a list of all the interaction types that exist in your community. And independently, you will think about what are the five levels of engagement in the leadership criteria you have. And then you're gonna put them together as one single grouping based on the engagement and the type of interaction that you have. Moving on, this exact grouping will allow you to identify patterns that works and patterns, patterns that do not work. Uh, this could be, for example, what kind of conversation or interaction platform do I have? Does it work for everyone? If it doesn't work, do I want to prioritize or not? So finally, when you have identified those, you can prioritize your work to create more opportunities for people. So this really helps you to see what engagement effort in your community really works. So, so the first topic, again, people's interaction, you can think about Twitter, blog and article mentions, bug report, pull request, grant application, and hosting local events. So this in terms of our community is also a task that is done by community members. The second one is about band of engagement. So independent of what kind of engagement opportunities we have, we can think about how do people come in touch with my community first? How can they have sustained relationship with the community and how can we provide leadership? Or you can even think about if you're a community that offers teaching and learning uh, resources, you can think about people who come to learn, people who endorse your community, who participate, who collaborate, and eventually they go on to lead. Then combining them, what is the first contact? Did they read my tweet or a blog? The people who are in the sustained relationship, are they maintaining my resources? People who are in the leadership position, are they taking ownership of the local events? And then finally, based on our third point, we can think about what are the pattern of engagement? Who is moving up and how? What works for them? Who gets stuck? Do they feel frustrated? Who leaves? And why do they leave? Can we repeat the success and avoid failures? So these questions to ask when you are identifying what works and what doesn't work. What makes it easy for someone to move up in your mountain of engagement? How can we make those pathways easier for others? What, what makes it difficult for someone to move? And how can we improve our support? Are there places where people are happy to be stuck? 
So getting stuck is not a problem, right? Sometimes people just want to do something that they like. They, de- they don't want to particularly move to leadership positions. Um, so you need to also think about that, that you, you, you're not forcing people to leave their band and go to next level. And then you're going to prioritize your work to create more opportunities. At this point, what's important is to decide where to put your effort. Maybe at this point of time, you want to put your effort in making your community more visible. In the next step, you might want to engage more with the people who are already there. In later step, you might want to go on and involve more people who haven't heard about your community. And in the in those cases, sharing stories are very important. Telling stories of people who already exist what has been successful for them? What, what did not work? What did you change? You need to be communicating and things very transparently and specifically when you're creating an open project. Finally comes, comes the reflection. What do you want it to convey to your community about how you value, delegate and elevate people in your culture? So the reflection question could be what kind of pattern do I see as people move along the mountain of engagement? What do these pattern illustrate about my community and how should I revise my own leadership goal? So as a leader, open leader, your role is to create leadership opportunities for others within your community. So you're gonna collect a lot of data when you're doing this. Um, so we need to tell you a little bit about data. We are not lawyer and this is not legal advice, but when you're using, for example, survey, comply with GDPR or something similar that exists in your country. Keep your data appropriate to your needs and don't use it for a, for a different purpose that you haven't communicated. When you share your data, convey your story you want to tell and never change the link so that people can come back to and even track the history of how you have advanced in your community. Um, I'm not sure if GDPR applies to everybody's work, but in any case, Collect the least amount of data in the most anonymous way possible. Share your policy and plan with the participants early on. Store it securely and use it only as stated and delete it when you're not using it anymore. And the big story of this whole mountain of engagement is to see what your culture is. If you remember the culture conversation we had a few weeks ago, that culture develops. So if you want to be a part of it or not is your decision. If you don't become part of it, your culture can move away from the vision that you have established for your community. So your engagement actually shows what is uh, what you actually value. It's also a methodology for data collection, engagement, equity, and storytelling. Because we're working in a very digital world, a lot of things can be only told by data and the progress. And this is a good way to track that. So I'm quickly going to... Uh, move on to the community interaction because it closely relates to mountain of engagement uh, because we talk about how are we interacting with our community and creating engagement opportunities with them. So we will be thinking about these five things. Are we gifting something? Are we creating something together? Are we soliciting ideas? Are we learning through use? Or are we only networking common interests? Or it could be all five of them at the same time in your community. Um, so I will leave a reference for you to read afterwards, and we will also give you an assignment for after cohort call, but in interest of time, I will stop here. So that was a lot squeezed into 10 minutes. Um, and our next speaker is Kirsty, who will continue on. Kirsty is my uh, supervisor, and before I started to work with her, she was my mentor for um, almost over a year, and I'm very excited that she's on the call today. Am I starting now, or do we have the question, any questions for you? Okay, I, I'm okay. <laughs> I uh, can uh, folks give me a little wave if you can see the slides. Yeah, excellent, excellent. So thank you so much. Um, I'm wildly delighted to be here. It's really inspiring to see so many uh, people being part of the Open Life Science um, Leadership Program. I think the 
topics that we've already covered on this call are amazing, but the whole syllabus is just really, really valuable. And I hope you find it valuable um, sort of very generally in your life, uh, as well as for, for running your project. So I'm going to build on um, the previous talks, just thinking about personas and pathways. Um, I put in a picture of me. This is me using a Docker at a, a collaborative training event called Neuro Academy. It used to be just one week, so it's Neuro Hack Week a few years ago. Um, I am a research fellow at the Alan Turing Institute now. Um, I used to be a neuroscientist and brain imager. I still do a little bit of that. And I'm particularly interested in trying to figure out how people um, can effectively work together. And I sort of feel very strongly that a lot of the structures that we have in our society set us up for failure. So thinking about that mountain of engagement that Malvika was describing, I think there are a lot of implicit assumptions, both in the academic in, um, institutions, but also just in a sort of capitalist um, economy more generally, that I, I would really encourage you to sort of think about undoing, think about unpicking it. You don't have to just copy what people define as success in finance or in um, an academic institution traditionally run. So as a nice, oh sorry, this is the, um, the point of this presentation, is to think about kind of tools that you have to increase participation in your project. Um, and the best way to increase participation is to remove barriers to participation. Um, and so there was this prompt in the, the um, slides, which I really liked of what will your participation do for your contributors? So it's very tempting to think about what are the, what are the contributors going to do for me, but it's actually an easier and more effective way of working to think about what you are in control of and what you are able to deliver for your contributors. So open leaders design and build projects that empower others to collaborate within inclusive communities. That's what we're all working towards over this training program. And um, the goal is not to ask what they can do for you, but more to ask what I or what we in the leadership can do for them. And um, the reason that I picked this, this picture uh, is I love thinking about the emergent properties of a system. So these are a bunch of ants and they're all working together and each individual ant is not particularly strong, but together and when they are coordinated, they are really, really powerful. And I think that's what I find really exciting about um, open and inclusive collaboration. So this is, I'm sure you've seen this in lots and lots of your talks for the open leadership framework. This is just sort of focusing for you on the top right corner, focusing on participation and inclusion, thinking about those community interactions, um, thinking about the governance. Governance is one of the things that people generally shy away from because they think that the adults in the room will make the decisions and actually you as the leader, even if there's like literally nobody else in your community yet, you are now the head of that community and you are in charge of decision-making, you're in charge of delegating and devolving some of those responsibilities and you are uh, managing that governance. And it's quite an uncomfortable space to step into, but it's extremely powerful and very, very rewarding when you do. Um, there was a nice, concrete, really fun exercise and potentially a really fun exercise to just sort of have conversations with people as you're talking about your project is a description of an imaginary person uh, who might be a member of your community. They might be users, they might be contributors, they might be funders, there's all of those different people that sort of enable your community and your project to thrive. And they, I recommend that it's not a real person. It gets a little bit too sort of personal to have like lots of conversations about specific individuals, but you can absolutely use conversations with real individuals to inspire a general um, persona. Now, that is not to say that your personas 
should be general. It's actually very powerful to draw specific, and in this case, obviously literally draw, but um, I meant draw in a figurative sense, specific uh, imagined people. So you've got Kat and Tom here in the examples. So put a name on there because it just makes them a little bit more human, a little bit more relatable, give them an age, give them um, an ethnicity, give them a job or maybe other responsibilities, give them some skills, a level of knowledge, think about what their background has been. And once you've done that, think about their needs, their motivations and their barriers. Um, so you're really trying to consider this person as a, as a whole and multidimensional persona. So you're not just dreaming up somebody who's going to come along and format your website. You're thinking about a whole person who may happen to have some skills or be interested in developing skills to, for example, format your website. And what can you give to them that uh, is beneficial? So just as some examples here, you've got Kat, who's an undergraduate, an intern, who's really interested in science, and uh, she doesn't have very much money. And Tom is 50 years old, he's a humanitarian, he's a PhD, he has nine cats, and he's got more of a difficulty around uh, time constraints. And so the, the question, the exercise is, how can they each be part of your project? So this is an example persona. I'm not going to read through it because you have the slides for yourself, but that, this is an example of how long a persona might be, two, three paragraphs, something like that. Um, and I have to say, one of the difficulties that I find with writing personas is that I tend to just write about myself. So this like line at the bottom of cat also suffers from a lack of self-esteem. Essentially, like every persona that I come up with says, she doesn't feel like she has enough knowledge to contribute or something along those lines. It's very helpful to actually engage a diverse and inclusive group of people in helping you build the personas in the first place. Otherwise, you'll continue to just manifest like different versions of you with different names. Um, so how are people going to join your open project? And the personas are fun. They're pretty interesting the pathways are the real sort of powerhouse. So you need the persona in order to think about the journey that people will take uh, to contribute to the project. And uh, I love this picture of, it is your responsibility, in my opinion, as the lead of the project to remove the barriers, to make it a nice, clear, easy path that Kat can walk along. So, uh, this is sort of going back to thinking about that mountain of engagement that Malvika was talking about. Uh, somebody has to discover that your project exists in the first place. So how are they going to do that? Then they will come into contact with it in some way. They might see you give a talk. They might hear about it on social media. They might have somebody else reach out to them. What does that look like? Then they might participate. Hopefully some of them will participate. Sustained participation means that they keep coming back, they keep participating. Networked participation means that they are starting to bring in other people and they're starting to bring in other sort of um, linked up projects, resources, um, other communities that you start to kind of link everyone together. And then leadership is really have, sort of being part of that, kind of holding that responsibility for the health of the community um and and thinking about directing the ship as it goes forwards and here's just an example of a pathway for cats so she might see a tweet about mozilla's festival buy a ticket um take part in a training program turn up to a hackathon but that'll be afterwards right so if she hosted her first mozilla sprint hackathon as the very um, discovery point, well, that doesn't make sense because she can't discover on that level, but she could potentially participate first. And so you're thinking about what each of these levels means for this individual person. Um, and the leadership is starting to go into that, that mentorship and that support and uh, role. Now, I've taken just two slides, I think, from another slide deck, which is available for you to look at because I, I probably have gone over time already. Um, there are lots of different ideas for ways of people to come in. And I think the best thing that you can do is you can just ask people 
why they contribute to other projects or why they don't contribute to other projects, what their challenges are. But mentored issues is a really, really nice way of getting started. So writing an issue on GitHub should a good first issue or an issue that is reserved for first timers should take longer to write than it would do for you to address. And that feels really counterintuitive unless you start to think about this path, these pathways in and this mountain of engagement. So if you spend time writing really good, um, accessible, easy to achieve, easy to kind of draw a line and say, I have, a, I have completed this issue, um, issues, you can put your name as a mentor or you can find other people in your community to say that they will kind of particularly shepherd this task along and that they are available for answering questions for those folks. And try very hard to reserve those issues. Try really hard to kind of keep them only for the newest members if you can. Um, if you have if a good issue, we'll have some information on how to get started, where to find help, some clear requirements, and then making sure that it's got, got the resources that the folks um, need. So you can make sure to try and stay as, be as friendly as possible, um, say thank you, um, welcome them, and give good, consistent, and helpful feedback as best you can. So rather than be tempted to complete the task for someone, um try and solicit the challenges that they're having in order to um guide them to completion it feels amazing when you complete a piece of work and if you've had someone support you along that journey it's a really sticky in a good way way of um joining and staying in the community try and think about just as sort of some other examples from a mentorship point of view you, people are going to discover the project they're going to participate for the first time um but they have first contact then they'll participate and then you need them to stay or you would ideally like a lot of them to stay so think about what you need what people will need from you in order to stick around and these are just some of the examples you can check out and think about your projects um so working open is being responsibly responsive to your community needs um, there's a bunch of different uh, solutions here, and I am going to, um, I think, finish and let you kind of think about uh, how you would like your project to succeed going forward. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kirsty. <laughs> Um, that's really amazing. So we have a question that's come in, or maybe it's a comment. Uh, someone is saying uh, mentored issues. So it does seem really important and helpful to identify who a new participant should talk with directly when they first contribute. It can be difficult to know who the point person is of a particular part of a project. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. Also, the longer a project has been going on, the more likely it is that it's really confusing. Yeah. I, my projects tend to be really confusing. I have like way too many open issues and I feel very comfortable with chaos. And it's actually like a massive barrier for participation. And so, um, yes, it's absolutely the case. I think the label is really good. And, you know, that's sort of like trying to identify like one, like issues that really are rocking along. But also as you start to get, uh, as the projects get a little bit bigger, mentoring an issue is something that potentially um less confident members of the community would actually be exactly perfect to do so as you go up that sort of mountain of engagement there's maybe a better responsibility of the most senior people or the people who've been there for the longest to reach out to people sort of I don't know if, I don't like really like the mountain in terms of saying up and down but like people who are sort of building up their engagement with the project and ask them if they would be a mentor for the, for the issue so thinking about kind of as you transition from helping people to having those people self-identify as mentors on particular issues okay uh, thank you so much Kirsty. 
So if anyone has any more questions, uh, we have Kirsty's contact info. Uh, it's about line 319. If you have line numbers, um, email, we have an email and social media contact info. Um, I'm going to move on. We have 10 minutes left and we theoretically have closing and a 10 minute breakout room. That's going to be a push. So let's make this an eight breakout room, eight minute breakout room. Uh, so we're going to talk a bit about balance uh, and value exchanges. So for this breakout room, we're going to go for about three minutes per person. Um, uh, and we're going to say, what kind of things do you give to others in your open leadership practices? So what are we giving? Oh, which is basically perfectly echoing Kirsty's talk. Uh, what things do you get back? And does that balance seem right to you? So are you looking after the people who are contributing and is it fair and is it reasonable? Um, so as, are the instructions clear for this one? Okay, I have some nods and thumbs up and I am going to now panic and send you to the breakout rooms. Uh, same rooms as before and here you go. Uh, people are beginning to filter back. Okay, so I'm sorry, that was probably, I think that was one of the quickest breakout rooms in history, um, but uh, Toby actually needs the other breakout room back at half past, uh, so we have, we have like 90 seconds left. <laughs> um, so uh, I hope that was an interesting discussion, I hope we didn't cut you all off too much. Uh, if you want to add any insights or thoughts about the, the value exchange that you give, add them to the Google Doc. Um, and I'm just gonna wrap up quickly. So we have some assignments, uh, unconscious bias. We have a handout um, for you to implement in your own work. We have uh, more information about the amount of engagement and we have the persona and pathway assignment from the Mozilla Open Leadership Program. Um, and like Kirsty's pointed out, having personas you can talk about can be really handy in your work. Um, we also have a couple bits of further reading as well. And then the next cohort call, we have one in two weeks. That will be the practice for presentations, I think. Yeah. Um, but also there's an optional cohort call next week. Um, that one we're talking about personal care, mental health, and also careers within academia. So it's an hour and a half split over two different topics. And I think we have three speakers planned talking about different aspects of um, diff different careers in and outside academia. Uh, and as usual, please don't forget to hop down to the feedback. We'd love to hear if there's anything that you think we should change on what did work or didn't work. And if you haven't uh, done the mid the midterm survey please do remember to do that because it helps us out to improve our program as well and it is very nearly time for us to go and toby needs the room so thank you so much everybody and um have a great week we'll see you again later thanks everyone bye, bye. thank you bye-bye everyone bye thank you, bye -bye, thank you. thanks yo